But the most important thing, right, Kevin, is to overrule Roe v. Wade, which is in a terrible, terrible decision that leaves America out there as an outlier, right, with, yeah. with North Korea and China. Well, welcome to The Kevin Roberts Show. If you have been watching or listening or both, thanks for doing that. You're in for another great conversation. You you may not yet realize, if, if you've not tuned in for a while, that we've turned this show into entirely a conversation. And today, I get to have a conversation with a great American patriot, someone you probably know, but just in case you don't, brief introduction. Mark Paoletta, thanks for being here. You're a senior fellow at the Center for Renewing America and also partner at Sheer Jaffe Law Firm. And those of us who have the privilege of doing the people's work here in Washington, D.C., know that you are someone we can count on to always tell the truth, to hit hard when hitting hard is necessary, and to do so while also keeping a smile on your face. So thanks for joining me. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Uh, in sure. fact, you and I were having so much fun talking about what we were going to talk about. I said, let's stop and just start recording. I get wound up, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great compliment. You know, the, the teacher in me always says, when I see passionate people, even reasonably passionate people on the other side, I've had to deal with apathetic students in classrooms so much that I just love seeing the lack of apathy, you know, the, the opposite of that, which is passion. I'm not so, apathetic. <laughs> I'm glad you have it. We've got a lot to talk about. So let's cut to the chase. So obviously the news of this era of, of this month is this leak of a draft opinion at the Supreme Court. I'm happy to talk about the leak. I'm far more interested in a couple of things from you. So, you know, ground rules, you can talk about whatever you want, but I'm interested in what you think about the potential opinion regarding the Dobbs case. But also this is very much in line with a lot of the work you've been doing over the years, and that is the attack by the left on institutions, in this case, the Supreme Court. Yeah. I mean, the leak was just atrocious and a great betrayal and despicable, in my view. Um, and I think it's it's shocking. Right? It's never happened before, yeah. but it's almost fitting, right, mm -hmm. in a way, because the Supreme Court entered these abortion wars in 1973 with an abomination of an opinion, Roe. You know, and as Justice Alito says in this draft opinion, it ha it's, it's the big lie. Yeah. Uh, they, they created this history and tradition, um, and it's so. I so so he goes through just on the on the opinion. He goes through why Roe never added up. It, it was a lie, uh, and uh, it has no place in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't have anything to say about abortion, and it's returning it to the mm -hmm. people for them uh, to, to to decide what to do in each of their states. Um, but again, I go back to it. it's fitting because the left saw with 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 Roe and in a lot of cases around that time that this was their way to get their their vision into America because they couldn't get it through the popular will, mm -hmm. right? Which is what our country is founded on, and protecting rights that are in the Constitution, right? But outside of that, leave it to the people. And so they love the Supreme Court to be their super legislature to go enact their agenda, right? And once they saw right with this opinion. Right. Yep. That it was gone, that the Supreme Court was no longer useful to them. They wanted to just burn it to the ground. And that's what this signals is yep. that they don't they, they, they want to take on the Supreme Court. They want to take on our institutions and they want to burn them to the ground if they're not working for them. So it's 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 scary. I mean, it's it's unnerving, mm -hmm. but I, I'm a big believer. As we talk, I'm an optimist. We will get through this, and the Supreme Court will survive and will be as strong as ever. And in fact, stronger because it's returning our constitu you know, returning the court to our constitution and letting all those other issues that are not in the constitution be with the American people. Well, that's well said. And, and I'm going to come back to your, your articulate point about the left's attack on the institution of the Supreme Court. But I don't want to lose this really important thread about overturning Roe versus Wade potentially. And we say potentially because right. it was just a draft opinion. Yeah. I've been telling folks the last couple of days uh, let's be sure that we don't get caught up in just talking about the leak, that we don't get caught up in, 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 the, in the left's framing of this as, as extremism. In other words, and again, this is the teacher in me, let's go to the text. Be sure to read the draft opinion. It's, it's likely to change, but we'll put that in the show notes. And so prognosticate for us what you think is going to happen ultimately. I've had a lot of friends from around the country call me, text me, email me and say, what do you think is going to happen? Do you do you really think that the left's intimidation tactics are going to cause this decision to be different than it appeared to be in February? Uh, no, 
Good. I, I think uh, that absolutely, was the right absolutely answer, not. Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think you know, it's a it's a an opinion from February. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping the court rules and issues the opinion soon. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when you look at Justice Alito's draft opinion, it looks like he's he's done a a lot, a lot of work in terms of addressing various issues that other justices have raised from the, from the oral arguments and things like that, right? So I do think it will change, but I don't think dramatically so. I think at the end of the day, it's a, he wouldn't have written it this way if he didn't have five votes that, that was a full-throated, you know, um, demolition of the logic and illogic of, of Roe. And, um, and so I don't think it's going to change in that regard. And I don't think... I'm hopeful the opinion doesn't change much at all uh, when yeah. it comes out. And I hope it comes out soon because I think it's an, un, you know, it's an unprecedented act. And I think given that, uh, I think the court should get its, you know, sort of let the justices kind of finish up. It's been yeah. out there three months uh, and to issue it as, as quickly as possible. And we've argued for the same thing at Heritage that for a whole bunch of reasons. And so follow up question. And, and I, I mean this with as much charity as I can muster toward the chief justice, both given his position and as a as a human, although there are some frustrations. What do you think he does? Uh, d does his ultimate opinion given the leak, given the assault um, on the institution, and hopefully it's just that, that it's not an assault that, that goes to particular people, that that's going to be affected at all because of, of those intimidation tactics? Um, I haven't focused too much on the chief. Okay. I mean, there's five votes for... Uh, and for to be fair, what the chief, did, sorry for the interjection, sure. what the chief does is immaterial if what you just said is right. That, right. The yeah. court, for purposes of yeah. Roe v. Wade, are the five justices who, 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 who or, for, or for Dobbs, yeah. are for the five justices in the majority. That's the court yeah. uh, for purposes of this opinion. Right. Um, it'd be great if he joined on. Yeah. Uh, That's and I, I don't going. know, like I said, it's, it's it, it could be that he joins on. It was, yeah. a, again, a February opinion. I guess the, the, the leaker uh, had told uh, the political reporter that it, the, the lineup hadn't changed, I guess, as yeah. of the, the, the leak. Um, but the most important thing, right, Kevin, is to overrule Roe v. Wade, which is in a terrible, terrible decision that leaves America out there as an outlier, right, with, yeah. with North Korea and China in terms of the barbarity of abortion. And so as a policy matter, right, um, I'm very pro-life, yeah. uh, and this is a very pro-life, pro-woman <laughs> decision. Right. Uh, you know, but as a constitutional matter, right, it has no place in the Constitution. It goes back to the, uh, the states to let them decide, um, you know, what— uh, what those states fit for the, for, you know, for their states. So um, right. it's a great day. I mean, it's a ter that's a thing. It's a terrible, terrible act mm -hmm. to try and burn down the, the, the institution of the Supreme Court. But th as, as the chief, you know, said, this is the, this authenticated this this leaked opinion. And if it stays, it's a great day for America, and it's a great day for constitutional law. Yeah, it is, and and it's a great day for women, for men, for for families. And, 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 yeah, yeah. and I'll say, the, the thing that get, hasn't been discussed really is that, you know, when you have a majority opinion, right, it's the senior justice in that, that, that group who assigns the opinion, right? So um, uh, and if, this, if it's the chief justice in it, he would, he would be the, the senior justice, even right. though he's not the longest serving. But in this case, it's Justice Thomas. And here's a guy who came onto the court and voted in dissent, right? In Casey, which was another abomination yes. uh, 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 by the Supreme Court, um, and and here he assigns this opinion to Sam Alito. He could have written this opinion himself. A guy who's written so much, a justice who's written so much mm -hmm. on both why it's uh, you know why this has no place in the Constitution, but also the barbarity of abortion, and he has the humbleness and I and the leadership to assign it to you know to someone else. To have the, you know, in my view, one of the most important decisions that's going to come down in the next 50 years yeah. uh, to Sam Alito. And I just think that's beautiful and speaks so well of Justice Thomas it, it in does. that regard. You know? It does. And, and, and imagine Justice Alito, who shares that level of, of humility, both personal and professional, as, as we sit here speculating about things, um, probably being very moved by having the opportunity to do that. And I, I really want to take a few moments, Mark, if, if you're willing, and I presume you you will be given some public statements of yours that I will read to talk about the justices, but in particular, Justice Thomas, yeah. because those of us who are lifelong movement conservatives adore a few people. We adore Ronald Reagan. We adore Margaret Thatcher. We adore even my non-Catholic friends, John Paul II. We adore Clarence Thomas. 
And yet, or perhaps fittingly, if you're on the, the left of center because of what you said about Justice Thomas, just being a tour de force intellectually while also having this personal humility, he has been and his wife has been have, have, have uh, together have been the object of a lot of intimidation by the left. What do you make of that? Is this something that as conservatives complain about this, that you know we're overreacting or is this real and, and something that people who are listening or watching to this conversation should be concerned about? Um, I, I love Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, and um, he's the greatest man I know, uh, and I'm blessed to, to know him. Uh, they have been after him since the day, when I say the day he came to town, since the day he came into the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. uh, or actually um, in December of 1980, he gave an interview uh, that was in the Washington Post. And he, in my view, He's, he's the most principled man. He's the nicest man. He's the most caring man. I can go on and on about all the acts of kindness that, that Justice Thomas shows. Uh, I've been a longtime friend of his. But just being around him and see how he treats others, right, mm -hmm. at every station in life, it's just wondrous to see. Um, why does the left hate him? Um, he's a threat to their... Their, their, you know, their control mm -hmm. over th the narrative, and um, and so they want to dist they want to attack him and destroy him, and they've been trying to do that for, you know, forty years since yeah. before he went on the court. And I think this latest round, Kevin, of going after, in my view, you know, creating all this uh, this this false accusations of this uh, of, of 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 not recusing uh, we can get to this but with Ginny Thomas they're trying to go after Justice Thomas through his wife Ginny yeah. who used to work here at Heritage is a wonderful person has been in the public square has been a conservative actress her whole life and the left sort of changes the rules on all these things they want her to give up her career they want her to stay silent right it used to be we want you know, strong women. We want women who are vocal and have strong marriages, who have, uh, you know, two career families and stuff like that, that are people be able to pursue their passions. And yet they want Jenny Thomas to shut up and sit down and get yeah, in the kitchen. Right. And so it's extraordinarily um, condescending in addition to other things. Yeah. And so with back to Justice Thomas, I mean, I first met him in 1983 when I was a senior in college. And um, um, my I ended up up in Connecticut, uh, where I'm from. George Bush was campaigning for my uncle, uh, who was the Republican mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And at a separate event, uh, then EEOC Chairman Clarence Thomas was there at an event for Tom Mulady, who was the president of Sacred Heart University, became the ambassador of the Vatican, and my first mentor. And we connected up in like a Hilton uh, hotel lobby uh, for, for, to talk for about an hour. And he was just this electrifying guy, just, yeah. you know, and I was a, a high school, a, a college student, senior, and he was listening to me, you know what I mean, and talking to me. And, um, and so f flash forward, I, I, I then met him when I was in the, the Bush 41 White House and reached out to him about going on to the D.C. Circuit. Yeah. Um, but, but I think and, and what I saw was he took on, he called out the left. He called out the civil rights leadership, you know, um, uh, and that's what drove them crazy. Yeah. So when we were, when I was reading his speeches and all that from his time as the EOC chairman, you know, he he took them on and he called them out, and that's what made them angriest the most. I yeah. think is somebody who stood up to them and didn't back down. And you saw that for you know for, from for, for, for his entire career, never backing down, and that just getting them angry and angry and angry. And at the end of the day, Justice Thomas goes on the Supreme Court, right? He's become the leader of the Supreme Court, right? The originalist. Right. He, he, he was, you know, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the number of opinions he's laid down. Every single year, he writes the most opinions of any justice, right? He's up in the 30s. Some justices are down in the, like, 12, 13 yeah. per year. And so he's laying out his vision, uh, you know, and the court has come around to his view, yeah. right? And that's driven the left even crazier. Uh, he lives rent-free in their brains, uh, you know, uh, all the time. It's a real lesson for all of us who are conservatives about not being passive. You know, I, I like to say, let's be on offense every day. That's that's what we do at the Heritage Foundation these days. And, and by doing so, to come full circle in your commentary about Justice Thomas doesn't mean that we have to be offensive or insulting or ugly or uncharitable. It just means that we have the courage of our convictions. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's um, th that is, I think, the lesson you take from Justice Thomas is mm -hmm. the courage of your convictions. And, you know, uh, he has a litany of humility that hangs in his chambers. Yep. Right. It's a Catholic prayer that basically like I, 
you know, Lord, you know, make sure I don't want to be uh, loved or respected yeah. or look for those things, right? And yeah. that would be my guiding, my guiding light. Um, let me do the right thing and, and do your will. And that's just as Thomas, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so, and, and, and for young people listening to this or watching this, I mean, that is the, that, that, that is the right path. That is the most rewarding path. And just as Thomas sits atop you know, the legal establishment as the most, in my view, you know, influential justice, yeah. per, perhaps in our, in our, in, in our nation's history. Uh, and, um, and he's done it all with humility. Yeah, he has. It's, it's, it's such a core virtue. So uh, wonderful context for something. Some of your words I'm, I'll read for, for the audience. This is from just a couple of weeks ago. You were testifying in front of the House Committee on the Judiciary. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you probably, because you're modest, will be a little embarrassed that I'm going to take the time to read the first paragraph of your written testimony. But I want to do this for effect because of two reasons. First of all, this is a rhetorical tour de force and also correct. But the second thing is you just mentioned what younger people listening or watching this show might take as a as a lesson from Justice Thomas. And that's actually one of the reasons I do this show is not that I have all the answers, our guests do, that we're at a time in America where we need, those of us who've been around a little while, need to be thinking not just about ourselves, our respective professional positions, but what we do to help cohere this country, for that matter, even for those of us who are conservatives, cohere conservatism moving forward. And, you know, there might be little tidbits of wisdom here and there, but this paragraph actually speaks to that as well. And so here you say, thank you for this invitation to testify at this hearing titled Building Confidence in the Supreme Court Through Ethics and Recusal Reforms. Unfortunately, you go on, the title does not reflect what this (laughs) hearing is really about. If confidence in the court is lacking, it is not due to issues of ethics or recusals. You continue. Rather, confidence in the court is undermined by the coordinated campaign by some Democrats and their allies in the corporate media to smear conservative justices with the goal of delegitimizing the court. Why now, you ask? Because some liberals fear that the court finally has a working originalist majority that may sweep away a number of liberal precedents that cannot stand up to more rigorous constitutional scrutiny. And you conclude in this opening paragraph, Mark Paoletta. And in this effort, Democrats in the media are trying to threaten, intimidate, destroy, and remove any justice who may constitute this conservative working majority. This is April 27th, 2022, about a week or so before the leaked opinion. You were yeah. very prescient, my friend. Yeah, you know, and it's it's interesting, Kevin, sitting here today. I mean, uh, that's exa- th- that's what this is, has been all about, has been Roe, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and the desperate attempt by the left to, to preserve it and, and to, to destroy, take out any justice, you know, delegitimize the court so that if they can't, if they can't g- get the votes, they're gonna make people doubt the Supreme Court. And, and, and so it's, it's sort of, um, I don't say, gra- when I say gratifying, it's, it's interesting being revealed in mm-hmm. terms of how, what, what this is all about from all the attacks on Justice Thomas and his wife is all related to this. And you know what? That's what his entire confirmation was about, too. Yeah, that's right. right? The enti- and Justice Thomas called it out then, too, that it was all about abortion and that they, you know, they wanted to destroy him because they did not think, right? Even though he had not, as he said, he had not talked. It's he, he had not talked about it, right? He had yeah. not discussed it. And when you go back and look at his life, and again, I've been working on this book. You know, all the things he was interested in was all about, you know, um, you know, um, the effect of social policies on the on Black Americans, right? Right. And and you know, reading uh, all you know, and, um, uh, Native Son, mm-hmm. right? And reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and all of these authors, all these folks, the the Richard Wrights, the Ralph Ellisons, these are the folks that Cl- Clarence Thomas was reading. Had nothing to do about abortion. This wasn't his focus, right. right? And they just couldn't accept that, and they wanted to destroy him. And with these groups, they take their signals from each other, so that you saw, as Justice Thomas yeah. said, the NAACP opposed Clarence Thomas. How Absurd is that, right? But as Justice Thomas said, there was a letter from the AFL-CIO, right, telling the NAACP you have to you have to oppose Justice Thomas. That way, it gives license to everyone else to go after him, mm-hmm. right? From the from the women's groups, right, on abortion to the AFL to all these left groups, because the NAACP 
is attacking him and opposing him. And so it's just it, it's it's just this circle that keeps, you know, on this destructive force of trying to take down Justice Thomas, trying to take down the Supreme Court. Yeah, it, it, it really is disconcerting. So another question that I get from friends around the country is, Kevin, what can we do to help fix this? I mean, they would say, especially if they're listening to this conversation with you, if they happen to be unfamiliar with your work up to this point, that they understand you're doing a heck of a lot to, to help out. But what can the average American do to help defend Justice Thomas, his conservative colleagues on the court, more broadly to defend American institutions, which folks who are on the radical left really want to undermine? You know, l- let their members of Congress know uh, mm-hmm. that they that they support, you know, um, a returning abortion <laughs> decisions to the to, 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 to the states, right. you know, not having an activist Supreme Court um, and and. Um, you know, in, in voting, uh, you know, uh, in getting out there to vote, uh, their, what they, if this is their view, to, to vote that way, because it is an unrelenting assault on on our institutions and and uh, Justice Thomas and some, you know, and the the, the five right now that are yeah. that are that are coming under assault. You see these, you know, these. Again, I think my next paragraph is about Chuck Schumer yeah. and how he directly threatens the Supreme Court justices. This is, again, it's it's so in terms of the <laughs> all coming home to roost. It was an abortion decision that they were hearing, an abortion case and back in March of 2020 when Chuck Schumer is standing outside this, the, the steps of the Supreme Court and directly addressing Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, the newest mm-hmm. justices at the time, saying, you know, you will reap the whirlwind. You won't know what hit you. Yeah. The, to me, that's shocking. Yeah. You, know, you have crazy people out there. You have, you know, uh, across our country. But the, the, the Democratic leader of the, of the Senate, like standing on the court, uh, on the steps of the court, threatening these folks, what I think is physically threatening yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, it's very um, clear. On an abortion case. So it all goes back, right, to abortion. It was there when Justice Thomas was nominated in 1991. It continues to this day. And again, so not shocking that there's this leak, an unprecedented act, because it's abortion. Right. And um, and hopefully we're going to move past this. You know, and I, I'm happy that the chief justice said you're foolish to think you're going to have any effect on our operations. And I hope that, you know, I, I do think that's that the court is going to dig in yeah. in terms of the protection of their institution. They're going to issue this opinion and they're going to keep moving on. Well, we, we must for so many reasons. And, and you, you mentioned the episode with Chuck Schumer from a couple of years ago. And I thought that was about the worst thing I had had heard an elected official say or do regarding undermining the court and and certainly intimating some kind of physical violence against conservative justices until this month when not only our illustrious press secretary refused to condemn the violence, but our own president, who says that he's a faithful Catholic, refusing to condemn the the threats of violence. What do you make of that? I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. Do you think the progressive activists that are now planning protests outside some of the justices' houses are extreme? No, peaceful protest is not extreme. So he doesn't care if they're protesting outside the Supreme Court or outside someone's private residence. I I don't have an official U.S. government position on where people protest. I'm not overreacting. Yeah. No, no. It's cravenness. It is. It's It's good work. You know, he's, he's he's, he's completely in the throes of the hard progressive left. Yeah. Right. And so he's whatever he decided when he was running again, that this was his answer. This was his pathway to victory. It's it's a pathway to the worst presidency of all time. It's despicable what Joe Biden is doing. President Biden is doing right now in terms of not condemning, allowing yeah. people to, you know, encouraging people to go to justice's homes. Yeah. I mean, it's dangerous. It is. And it's despicable. But it just shows how he can't see, he'll never say anything that crosses the left on these that's issues. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, and you saw it going all the way back to, 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 he told people he didn't believe in Nita Hill 
at the time, I've written on this extensively. He told our own inspector he didn't believe in Nita Hill. He told Orrin Hatch he didn't believe in Nita Hill. I think he, you know, he told several people he didn't believe in Nita Hill. And yet he let these, 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 th- th- these hearings go on, yeah. right, out in public with the most baseless of smears against Justice Thomas. And I set up a website at a certain point because I was so sick of the lies. It's called Anita, AnitaHillCase.com. If okay. any of your viewers want to go. AnitaHillCase.com. Yeah. Okay. Why her case never added up yeah. <laughs> is the subtitle of it. And it's got every an analysis of her, you know, her statements, all of the people who, who testified that, that, that there were many uh, for her mm-hmm. and why all of their statements are lies or, or, or you know, don't add up. Um, and um, and so but that's Joe Biden. He let this go on. Right. He's the guy who did Robert Bork. Right. Yeah. He's the guy who destroyed the Supreme Court confirmation process. Right. Mm-hmm. He said, you know, Bork was well qualified. And then after he was blown up for plagiarism, because that's what happened, right? He was yep. in the presidential uh, primaries. He was, you know, a, a, a plagiarist. And, um, and and to get back in, I think it was his wife who said, this was for Joe to re- regain his right. credibility on the left, was to go savage our most respected, you know, Supreme Court nominee probably in history in terms yes. of qualified, right? And they, he did him in like that in yep. such a despicable fashion. And then Thomas comes next, right? Yep. Uh, and um, so, yeah, it's, it is very disconcerting that both the press secretary, who's thankfully leaving, uh, I think, uh, very soon, yeah. and, and Joe Biden, uh, President Biden, don't condemn this sort of action by the left in terms of threatening, which is what it is, Supreme Court justices. Yeah, as I sit here listening to you recount Joe Biden's less than illustrious history, generally, but especially less than illustrious history in judicial confirmation hearings, you realize as as pleasant as he seems to so many Americans, there are few Americans, I don't mean this as hyperbole, there are few <clears throat> Americans who've done more to destroy American institutional life than Joe Biden. Yeah. I mean, that's one of his legacies. That's uh, sad. Yeah. I, don't, I don't celebrate that. I mean, it would be nice one day if, we, if in America we could get back to getting back to belief in American institutions as being neither a liberal nor a conservative thing. That's that's where I'm going with that complaint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, and, and to go after, you know, again, in terms of Justice Thomas um, and, and the kind of person he is, some of the, you know, for during his confirmation, there, there was a um, there was a nun who testified for him. And I, I call him the, the real hearings. Yeah, uh, right. You know, uh, her name is Sister Virgilius and yeah. she was his eighth grade uh, teacher that's and the right. principal. Right. And I was the one who went and got her to go uh, to convince her to come testify. You're a smart guy, Mark. And, I'm glad and you're she, on our side. She, uh, she, she had broken her arm just before the hearings. And I told her, sister, that's, that's okay. And you she, were thinking it's even better. Well, no, I was actually thinking, I just want you there. And <laughs> yeah, she right. called me the devil. <laughs> and I drove up and, I, and I, I brought her down and she testified. But I'll tell you, Kevin, that for probably more than a decade, Justice Thomas and I would go up on every Martin Luther King Day mm. – and go visit the nuns at their retirement home with Sister Virgilius. Uh, we'd, we'd leave about six in the morning. We'd get up to, it's up in Tenafly, New Jersey. Yeah. And we'd go spend the day with about 60, 70 nuns who were the youngest one was maybe in their 60s. Right. right. And there were a bunch in the infirmary. And he'd go around and talk to every single nun. Right. And, and we'd have lunch with them. And we'd stay, in, and he stays in touch with them. But that's the kind of guy he is. You, yeah. you know, what I mean, that's the, the in terms of the impact on his life, right? It's his grandfather and his and grandmother. His memoirs are called "My Grandfather's Son," and yeah. then the nuns. And if you listen to him talk, and never forget, right, who helped him from the circumstances in which he was born, right? In the seg, people forget, like Justice Thomas was born into utter poverty. In the segregated South in 1948, right, his father left when he was two years old, right? His mom was a maid and was working, I think, at nine years old uh, 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 with oysters, you know, uh, yeah. and, 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 and crab and, and, and the crab house. And, you know, to, to come from that background to go to the Supreme Court in one generation, right? And it was because his grandfather provides him all these lessons and, 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 and teaches him and lives the life to show him how you, how you get ahead, how you live the right life. But then it's the nuns yeah. uh, that he goes to school at St. Benedict's, which is a, a segregated uh, school down in the Deep South. And he stays in touch with these nuns his entire life, right? It's just this yeah. beautiful story of, of, of how he, he never forgot and, he's, and he gives back until this day. Yeah. And in fact, uh, last year there was a dedication of a statue to them. 
uh, sort of during the whole 30th anniversary, just yeah. before the event here at Heritage. Okay. Um, and we went up to this beautiful ceremony uh, to dedicate the statue. And, you know, probably I think 20 nuns were there. Now they're in their, their 90s, right? Sure. And um, what a anyways, beautiful story. It's, it says it's, so much about the man. It's it's and, and again another organization he's very very involved with this is Horatio Alger Association, mm -hmm. which is a, a group that uh, provides scholarships to really really you know kids who have come from terrible circumstances and, and you know, I've been to some of these events and they tell their stories and it's abuse and it's terrible just awful stuff, and but they they have somebody you know they they have a dream and they want to get their education yeah. and this organization i think it's uh, you know several hundred million dollars to about 35,000 uh, st uh, students and just as thomas is in this organization and he meets with every one of those students hours right of just meeting with them and getting to know them and listening to them and helping them and mentoring them and that's the kind of stuff that I see yeah. day in and day out as, as his friend when we either travel around or we're, you know, at events or at, at different, um, uh, you know, organizations. He's the most giving man to, to anyone in any station of life. Yeah. And, um, and they say that, you know, like when you read pr profiles of Justice Thomas and they might be trashing him for X, Y, Z. Everyone says that, you know, from the janitor to a yeah. justice, everyone loves Justice Thomas. And you read that, but I'm telling you, it that doesn't do sort of justice yeah. to like the, the 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 type of person he is uh, as as he as he lives his life. That says so much. Thanks for for sharing that with us. Yeah. So you've written a book about all of this and uh, coming out soon. Yes, yeah. titled "Created yeah. Equal." Give us a preview. Tell us why we need to rush out and buy a copy. So it's. Uh, uh, it's it's called Create Equal. It's based on it. So I I didn't write it. I'll I'll, I'll just, uh, so it's um there was a great movie um yep. for your for your viewers um called Created Equal which is shown on PBS. It's available on Amazon and other platforms. Um it's an incredible it's a, it's a documentary about the life of Justice it Thomas from from you know from Pinpoint Georgia through his life you know up into the Supreme Court and onto the Supreme Court in his jurisprudence. And it was 20, um, w and I was very involved with the making of that right. film. And it was about 25 hours of interviews with Justice Thomas and six hours with Ginny Thomas. And, and so when you make a movie, obviously it's only two hours and probably at the end of the day, an hour of Justice Thomas's comments are in there, right? You have film clips and stuff yeah. like that. And it was just killing me. Uh, having seen all this great stuff he said, uh, that would be on the, the cutting room floor, yeah. right? Uh, just because it couldn't get into a two-hour movie. That, um, uh, you know, I had, Michael Pack is the director. And I said, okay. Michael, we should make this into a book. Uh, so this is, so I didn't write it in yeah. terms of like, yeah. you know. It, it's, you uh, were spearheading it. Yeah, it yeah. was, but in Give terms of the, right. the, yeah. the pulling the interview together yeah. uh, and making it into a book form. Um, I, uh, with, with footnotes. So it's helpful to the reader yeah. when he's referencing something. Um, so yeah, I spent the past year working on that on and off a little bit more than a year and it's coming out June 21st. Regnery is the publisher. Good. And, uh, I hope a lot of people buy it cause I, it's, it's, it's to get the message of justice Thomas's life and his views and his jurisprudence out to the American people, uh, even those who know him and love him, but those who don't and want to learn more about him, and then even those who are his critics. Like, yeah. read this book. I challenge you to come away saying anything other than, here's a, here's a man who's lived an amazing life uh, and has a lot to say, and a lot of good things to say. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it comes out June 21st. That's great. I want to pick up on one of the many important things you just said, and that is, even if you disagree with his jurisprudence, you should read it. And the reason I want to do that is because I hear increasingly having some graduate school friends from the left of center place that I went to school and now I know your, your daughter went to school, uh, but good people uh, who certainly disagree with him, but they're, they're frustrated with how radical the left has become. Mm. And they, they're, you know, they're, they're Democrats and they're thinking that they may not have a political home. It's less likely that they're going to join the Republican Party. I understand that, although I might wish that they join the conservative movement. The point is, I think for them, and it's, it's, let's, let's be honest, there are millions of Americans in this camp who are left of center, who are thoughtful, who may disagree with Justice Thomas, but they're still open minded enough, especially given the harassment and intimidation of the court over the last few weeks. To read a book like that and say, I can at least appreciate that this is a human being I can I can really admire. We've got to get back to that in the United States. Yeah, uh, um, I, I agree. It's 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 an amazing story. Um, just one more one more story, just for your, your you know, I, I went I worked on Justice Thomas's confirmation mm -hmm. in the White House. Uh, so I was a young lawyer in 1991, 
And um, it was just a terrible experience. But out of that came, you know, was born this friendship. A couple months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. So Justice Thomas has just gone on the court now. He's, he's pretty beat up, yeah. uh, you know, having gone through all that. I was diagnosed with cancer. And and I, my wife had just had our first child. And um, obviously a, a, a tough time for me. Justice Thomas called or visited me every single day. Really? Uh, yeah. And when I was going That's through remarkable. chemo. Uh, and my surgeries, he came to my hospital room unannounced uh, one time on a Saturday. Um, and uh, again, I say that just in terms of him thinking of me, right? Mm-hmm. He's on the court, he's busy, he's gone through his own hell. Uh, and yeah. here I am, a friend, you know, who's going through a tough time. And it was, you know, and so um, a, a couple months later, uh, well, a couple, many months later, when my hair had grown back, my hair grew back curly. It's a weird thing uh, for a I couple. I can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> for a couple couple of months, it was kind of curly uh, or wavy. And uh, he, he's he. I think Ginny had taken a photo of us, and he signed it. Um, great hair, buddy. <laughs> we a, we survived. What right? a great comment! And so that's it's a, such a beautiful on um, both things. You know, yeah, it's like a funny. Right. It made me laugh when he said great hair, and then we survived. Yeah, and it was our our, our joint hell of yep. going through these these uh, these challenges and um but just another that's the kind of person he is and i relate that story there's hundreds thousands of other people who do that and probably the the best place to see that is with his clerks mm-hmm. right and you read about justice thomas and you read about clerks every justice gets four clerks per year right so justice thomas has about 140 clerks now yeah. right and they're out there taking on the world and they love him uh, you know, he's down at the 11th Circuit Judicial Conference this week. Okay. Um, and there's a, I just got a photo of a bunch of the clerks that have gathered that, that are with him down there. Uh, and they're like his army. Yeah. And, oh, and, awesome. and, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, um, he, 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 he breeds, he, he, he brings that loyalty. He develops yeah. that loyalty, you know, of, 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 of his clerks and his friends. Yeah. It says a lot about the man. Yeah. Well, Mark Paoletta, I would sit here and talk to you for hours. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. You're a busy guy. So, so we won't do that, but maybe we'll do that over the years. I do want to ask you one final question and you've seen a lot. You've served yourself in a number of administrations. Of course, you do work beyond what you talked about today, including religious freedom. Maybe another time we'll talk more about that because it's such an important issue. But the question is this. It seems like every month there are more reasons for Americans to feel discouraged and even kind of depressed about the state of our political discourse, about the state of the American ideal. Why, however, in spite of all that, did you wake up this morning optimistic? I'm an optimist. Um, but when you look at when you look at the facts, the Supreme Court is overruling <laughs> Roe v. Wade, uh, which is what reason. we've been working for for you know 50 years. So you know we have a court. Uh, you know I'm a, I'm a big believer. The America's best days are ahead of it. Th- th- these th- th- and I think the, this craziness is a you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. And yeah. people just need courage, right? They're bullied. They hear all these crazy things that are anti-American or, you know, cancel culture, all that type of stuff. We can go through it. But I don't think most people believe it uh, and that they're afraid to speak up. And so showing those people the courage to stand up to what, for what you believe in. And then again, so, so, I, uh, so, so in, in, like I said, in terms of our institutions, we're gonna, 2022 is coming right around the corner. Uh, it's going to not, it's, yep. you know, the, the Democrats are not going to be in charge of the House and likely this and, and the Senate. So uh, that's a break on anything President Biden is going to be doing. And the Supreme Court finally has a, a, a conservative working majority. So we should be rejoicing yeah. uh, and looking for, uh, you know, toward the future with optimism. That's my view. Yeah. Well, it's thanks. always been my view. <laughs> Mine, too. It's been a real joy sitting here with you. Thanks for everything you're doing, Mark. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks you, for having me on. Yeah, you bet. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. If you're enjoying the show, please give us a five-star rating. If you're not, then tune in and give us a five-star rating next time. (laughs) But all that to say, America's best days are ahead. I think you heard that from Mark. And thanks for making this show possible by tuning in. Take care.